Ladies and gents, it's great to uh, announce our next session, Logistics Route to Your Customer, and it's sponsored by RSA Market Agents. And um, our panel consists of Anli, our facilitator, Anli Hutton, uh, Matthijs Enslund from DP World, Ariel Boerderijse CETE van de Merwe, and Market Agents uh, Jakku Oersteysen van our RSA Market Agents. Let's welcome our panel. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I trust by this time you've had your second cup of coffee and recovered from last night's network session um, and that you are all here with us uh, in spirit and in mind as well as in body. Um, it's such an honor to be able to join you today and to facilitate this panel discussion. Um, obviously, no part of the value chain can be considered more important than any other part, but none of us would produce potatoes, or none of you would produce potatoes, um, unless you could do something with them and get them to market. So that crucial route to your customer uh, is up for discussion today. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. I do believe uh, that we are going to include Vili as well, yes. You, you can join any time. This is okay. your conference. I, uh, you can't I, I say just no. need to get the, the answers first, and if you don't mind, because it's too far in the back to hear these guys properly. <laughs> you can thank join you. us. No worries. <laughs> guys, thank you for allowing me. They can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to kick off um, with you, Setia, if I may. Um, and just find out a little bit more about the challenges that you face in getting your product to market. Only, uh, morning, thank you. I think it's not as much a challenge as maybe an opportunity. Uh, what is a challenge though is that once faith now you must sit in English with Makar Prat, like Peter said yesterday. <laughs> Uh, how, do you, how do you say no to Willy? Um, I think for us as farmers, the, the challenge at this stage is that our product basically doubles in value but in 24 to 48 hours from leaving the farm. And there's a lot of insufficiencies uh, and uh, I think we can talk a long time about it but, and what the reasons are. But I think that's the, the biggest challenge, to get the, 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 the right variety, the right size, the right uh, class of quality to the best uh, outlet and market. Matthijs, from within the logistics sector, um, and you work with, with logistics and supply chain, what are some of the pain points that you see along that value chain and that you experience on your end? Yeah, thanks, Anli. Good morning, everybody. I'd just like to state, firstly, I have not delivered anything for anybody in this room, so if your loads were late today, not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> your current provider. Uh, yeah, I think, I think if we had to ask people, if you ignore the, the impact of cost and inflationary impact, and you had to ask the audience, I think the two things that will surface would be uh, lack of infrastructure, or infrastructure failing, and, and obviously port performance and, and transit performance, and the other one would be the impact of, so, of the current socio-economic environment. I believe though there's three other factors that are probably equally, maybe more important than those, and those are availability of talent. I think in the logistics industry, we really battle to find talent. I think we started with uh, graduate programs internally. Uh, we spent a lot of time and effort and big investment in the training and development of our own staff mm. to bridge that gap. I think safety is, a, is another very, very big issue, and specifically road safety. In the South African context, there's certainly not enough that's been done for road safety. I think uh, in-house, internally, we focus on driver training extensively to reduce accidents. Um, fatigue management is a major, major factor. I think uh, something that all of us will understand, because I think most people in this room probably own uh, a fleet of Superlink vehicles, or one or two at least, the legal working hours for, for a driver in South Africa is 15 hours. And thereafter, you have to have a nine-hour consecutive rest break. Mm -hmm. And not everybody adheres to those rules. So you can imagine the amount of fatigue. People behind steering wheels that are fatigued is a, is a major, major concern for us. Uh, we also extend that to the communities that we operate in. I'm very involved with the Fleetwatch magazine, support their initiative. 
where uh, holidaymakers, school children, and uh, traffic officials are targeted to increase the, the knowledge and the understanding of road safety. And uh, to date, we've reached in the excess of 1.6 million school children at about 1,900 schools. That's not, not even close to enough. It should be 10 times the number. Um, so yeah, safety, safety, big focus. And I think then, um, maybe the last one, if you, if you consider the ever-changing customer demands, client, client behavior changes all the time, and as a logistics company, you have to be flexible and agile to adjust for those changes, because the route to your client today is not the same route to the client a week or a month from today. So I think, I think other than the infrastructure and the obvious socioeconomic impact, definitely talent, safety, and staying in touch with your client. I think that's, those are the key focus areas for us. I mean, just, just to add on to that from uh, my experience in the news world, I mean, we, we so often do stories uh, where we're covering these truck mm. protests Sadly. where trucks are, uh, truck drivers are threatened violence is perpetrated, there's protest action, trucks are stopped. Um, and I think sometimes in our interaction as the broader public, when we see these stories, we think, oh, geez, that's so terrible, it must be, it must be a major problem. But how yeah. often in, you, in your experience does that really create blockages in the system? Yeah, I think often, because, I mean, what's the easiest way to block a road? Just park a superlink over it. So, um, <laughs> so all the time, I think it, it's sad, it's very sad, the loss of life and, and the drivers are often you know, sometimes the drivers also get hurt in the process, but uh, more needs to be done in, in that space. I think government works, we work with government closely um, to solve those issues, but I think it will always be there. So I don't have the solution, I actually don't have the answer. I do know that it adds cost to the, to the yeah. system, um, it adds complexity to the system, uh, to, the, to the point where Sastria insurance went up by in excess of 100% last year. Because policy, insurance policies just no longer yeah. can't, can't cater for it, can't afford it any longer. So we're going to get to those risk premiums built into the model in a little bit. Yaku, I'd like to come to you. Um, you work at the confluence point where product from different growers is aggregated. Um, what challenges do you see along that route in getting to you? Thank you, Anneli. Goeiemorgen, allemaal. Um, I think before, before I answer you, um, I've just got to maybe clarify a narrative so that I know what I'm talking about and maybe the audience also knows what I'm saying. So in our life, the customer is the producer. They pay us. And we serve their customer on their behalf, which is the buyer. The buyer most probably gets the opportunity to, to serve the end consumer. So in that space, and product coming to aggregation points, I think there are knowns. Quality of the roads, um, the availability of transport, when there's a convergence of season with the citrus or with the potatoes in the same time. You need, to, you need to be very astute to make sure that you have transport available to get a highly perishable product to market in the right condition. Um, so those are the knowns, um, but to some extent, I think we disregard the state or the quality of the aggregation points, where produce is sold and how those aggregation points are looked after and are they efficient for the next leg of the logistical challenge that lies ahead, offloading of, of product, moving it into sales or the space, um, potentially ambient or temperature spikes that uh, should not be there, are we focused at those, at those aggregation points to have an ideal environment for that specific product? And when you look specific potatoes and you have normally one holes, and um, I see there's a lag here, so I can say not political correct things and then run and switch it off and then <laughs> say the political <laughs> correct thing. Um, you know, when, when, when facilities then, let's take, for instance, Durban, and you have beautiful fresh potatoes in the hall, and suddenly the air conditioning system is not working for weeks on end, and you have those temperate, that's all part of the logistical challenge. In the end, that product lands up at Mrs. or Mr. Housewife or Houseman's table, 
and it's not in an ideal condition. So those are the things that I think sometimes we, that's not so visible, where in terms of other channels competing with fresh produce markets as an aggregation point, they have, they have more ideal um, facilities that, that um, could be attractive. But in the end, that's what I think, uh, where our challenge lies to make sure that our facilities are, are on, on par and, and, and on standard. Philly, I'm going to come to you here because you could possibly put me in my, in my place quicker um, <laughs> because I'm technically working for you here in my capacity. The fact that fresh produce markets are owned by municipalities, does that come into this conversation or are we there getting too political and does that discussion then become very much out of our hands? Um, Ali, yes, it is very political. Uh, whether it's too political or not, um, I'd, I'd want to state it as follows. Um, we are the users of that facilities. So at what point do we allow politics to take over the actual activities on that property? Um, for, me, for me, that needs to be operated as a proper commercial entity. Um, and we cannot allow politics to interfere with that. So I think the, the, the bigger question would be, how much are we going to tolerate the politics actually interfering with the session, mm. and not the other way around? Jakob, I'm going to come back to you um, while we're talking about fresh produce markets. So we've got all these challenges along the route, um, and that's everything from potholes to transport time to getting to you to how much gets to you at a certain time. Then you've got the challenges at the facilities themselves, and, and you're saying it's a highly perishable product. So. Looking at shelf time um, and pricing, because we're hearing from CETA, mm. a product that within 24 to 48 hours doubles in value. Talk to us about how that pricing works and, and, and where those challenges play into shelf life and pricing. Well, I, I think we all understand the functions of supply and demand and that markets form an incredibly important role in that process of price discovery. And it is a small or a large microcosm of the supply, of the total supply and demand in South Africa at a specific point in time. So when you look at that, and it's basically at this point in time, probably one of the most important reference points for producers to decide how their marketing strategy is going to be influenced in terms of that process. So if that process, and there's another element to it that I also think is sometimes unseen, we're in a highly regulated environment. So yes, we would like to call it a free or open market, but it cannot function without rules and regulations. And when those become um, diluted, whether it is the quality of the facility, whether it is the quality of the application of the rules and the regulation, it has an influence on the quality of price discovery. Within the agency model, we, we have taken up a lot of that lag that is not there, and agents have made the step up to fill those gaps to be able to still deliver probably world's best quality price discovery processes, which is, I think, producers rely on that in terms of making, making marketing decisions. So, yes, you can do it up to a point, but then you have to take a decision. Am I going to ask for ESCOM to give me power for 24 hours? Or am I going to take some of the responsibility, or all of it, to make sure that I have, I have sustainable power, so that we have sustainable, well-functioning, fresh produce markets is at the point where I think we need to take a decision. How's it going to look in the next 30 years? But that decision is now. Ali, yes. sorry, and maybe in that, just a, that's a question that I've got the biggest question on my mind is how, how do we understand the influence of stock levels and rising and, let's call it, building up of stock, specifically in a trading environment that's got a limited shelf life. 
Um, and on that, uh, we've done quite a number of calculations to determine what the capacities of each one of the market is to actually move the potatoes out. Um, what, what can be done um, to also create that clear message, to understand what the stock levels looks like, and also the impact on the value, uh, and, the, and the, let's call it the price discovery, um, at that specific point in time, given the stock movement? So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because because mm. that's ultimately where we really want to get to is mm. a um, worldwide just in time system mm. um, where every player in the chain understands what the stock levels are, where do I move my produce to, when to get the best value mm. for growers, for agents. Do you how do you see that working? See it here. What, what kind of system would be ideal for you? Uh, Lee, I think f from, from a grower's perspective, there's a couple of things that has an influence. Uh, I think, uh, as Vili mentioned, the, the, the capacity of the market or the facility has a huge influence. And then also, the, obviously, the, 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 the commission structure, the, the, the logistical cost, uh, and then each area, each region has a specific demand for size or variety. So if we were able to get a, a lot more transparency uh, in real time, uh, I think farmers would be able to better decide which way to go. For Aldri, for instance, we uh, make use of a, 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 a rather complex data uh, analysis program to decide uh, each day which uh, size, which variety, which quality, uh, in which volumes should go to which market. And uh, I think a, a lot of time, we as growers, we, we don't realize what the effect is of creating our own competition. We might use a certain route to a market, uh, to an area where your product is at the, that stage. For instance, let's say Durban, and you're using an alternative uh, direct marketing route, and that same product ends up just outside the market at a rand or two below that price. And that influence your, your complete price because Agents talk to each other, so it has an influence. That's the one thing. And uh, the other thing is even overstocking your product on a certain market. I think growers, especially from our area, it's, it's very comfortable just to send everything to Pretoria and Joburg, for instance. And it seems like the price on the regional markets or the smaller markets might not uh, rectify the transport cost, but the competition that you create for yourself on that market is a tremendous influence. It, it, it sounds like a very complex situation. Is it very difficult to make accurate projections? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh, there's... Well, we, we make use of a benchmarking system that we use between all the agents. Uh, it works a bit like the S&P 500, sort of, and we uh, benchmark the, the farm gate net price from all the different market agents. And that brings into consideration the commission cost. Because that's another thing. Let's say, for instance, uh, you send the, 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 the transport might uh, rectify the price you're getting at, uh, from, from us up in the north to, let's say, PE or Cape Town. But what you should remember is your commission is going to be higher as well because that price is higher. So you, you might do it at a loss. But uh, we bring that everything into consideration. And even that is not, there's, there's no, no one saying that was the best choice. Um, but at the end of the day, you need that information and transparency to, to make a better decision. Vili, if you'll excuse me, if, if I may switch to Afrikaans briefly. Yes. Did Malki Boere zeker nogal bieke ontsteld, dat die, dat die algemene publiek daar buiten dink, boere is maar two-tones, kamenikous, 
in die bakkie se cab, maar eindelijk is jylle bezig met baie komplekse financiële modellering om jylle goed by die rechte mark uit te kry tegen die beste prijs. And I can think it, it, it must be very frustrating. And, and I want to come to you, Matthijs, on the point of transparency, visibility. Um, just to give us some, some idea of volumes moving and where that transparency can be better leveraged. Yeah, I think, I think visibility is, as everybody's, I think even in the previous panel spoke about information availability, knowing stuff. Uh, I think visibility in supply chain is key because when you can synchronize all the supply chain activities, of course you can then solve for the most optimal solution, which should also be the most cost-effective solution. But to do that, you need information. So specifically to the quality transportation and warehousing components, a lot of work has been done. And those components of the supply chain or, or areas has been made visible and is, is visible today. Um, I think if you string it all together with a, with a proper logistics control tower, you need to start bringing other parts of the information in. You, you quoted systems or mentioned systems, I don't know what they do, but it sounds like they give information. Point is, if you can have the market information, understand the market information firstly, because that's what people consume. If you can translate that back to the farm, influence the yield in the production or the harvesting process in time, I know it's not that simple, I'm not a farmer. The point is you would then solve for a far better supply chain which is in sync with the market. I think that will bring stabilization possibly to price. You'll get less price fluctuation because there'll be more product available on a, on a, call it a more regular basis. Um, I think a good starting point though on visibility, I know Potato SA has done some work in, in developing their own app. I think currently the app, I, I haven't been on the app for a, for a while, but currently the app really focuses on the farming activity. You have to use that app, get involved, start using it, because the next step to that would be to link, to link the transportation, warehousing and market component to the very same app. Mm. And if we then all use that, you'll have the visibility in one place across the entire supply chain from the producer to the market and the stuff that happens in between. And when stuff is visible, when stuff is visible you can react to it. You can start to become proactive. We all, we all operate in a reactive environment mostly. Visibility takes you to a proactive yeah. place. And when the visibility is so good and you really see all the information, you can get to a place of predictability. We can start predicting the next day's demand. That's where you want to be. So I think 20, so, so when Willie talks about the visibility and, and everybody sees everything in transparency, he's onto something. Because mm. if, if you as an industry is not gonna sort that out, promise you someone else is busy solving oh. for that very same problem. So best you do it yourself because then it's your rules mm. and, and, your, and, and your guidelines, not someone else dictating to you how to do this. Mm. But yeah, visibility, um, we, heard, we, we heard the previous panel say the same thing. The more information you have, the more you know, the more you see, the more you can make the right decision. In, fu in future, last comment, in future, those people with the most available real-time information will make the best business decisions they will make the most money. They will be the biggest potato growers amongst all of us. Simple as that. So to me, as an, as an outsider, I mean, I've, I've only been sort of working in agriculture for just over three years, but, but very limited knowledge. I can, I can assume that it would be a very highly competitive environment where growers in the same kind of region really kind of want to almost keep their cards close to their chest and keep those, those little price secrets to themselves, the areas where they are managing to, to save on costs. Um, but this kind of transparency and visibility requires that I'm not going to spill. Am I wrong in making that assumption? How would it work, Yaku? I think, I don't know who said it, I think it's Adam Smith that said the secrets of production are far longer kept than the secrets of marketing and selling. And it's right in that space. But where we are, transparency is key and with that comes integrity of the price. So once somebody doesn't trust the price, you've got a problem. So I've yet to see, and the, and the context of just in time, for who just in time? But I have yet to see a more flexible, continuous, brand conscious beehive of a space than South African fresh produce markets that attracts buyers of all LSMs, the best producers in the world that are brand conscious, that give you affordable product 
365 days of the year that attract thousands of trucks, thousands of logistical elements, um, operating on a, in a price discovery environment, commission-based, and a highly regulated agency environment. And as an example, you know, buyers can trust that when they rock up at the market, wherever they come from, they're going to find product. And that doesn't exist at times when you're in more formal environments and rock up at the store and the shelf's empty. Very few times does that happen at these institutions. And that's why I think, you know, part of the process and what Billy is speaking about, we solve that and we solve the intelligence that comes with it. We're all beaters in that space. I want to take a, a brief step back and talk a little bit about the key cost drivers. Seti, I want to start with you. Um, when, when you're doing your breakdown to see what production actually costs you, up to the point of getting it to the market, how do you determine what component, you know, production is relatively easy to determine, I would assume, you know, what goes into the soil, what comes out, but then how do you determine the actual cost of that logistics component? Andy, we, well, uh, obviously there's, uh, there's, there's the direct cost, uh, and it, it depends on uh, where, where they are geographically, but the, I think the things that I mentioned earlier that we do not easily bring into consideration is being your own competition, overstocking a specific market. Okay. Uh, those kind of costs are very difficult to calculate. Uh, I think uh, it was last week in Tuesday, we were busy with onion uh, uh, harvesting in the north at this stage, and all of a sudden, uh, on Tuesday morning, the, the, the stock levels of onions would double what they used, usually come in on a Tuesday. So if I knew that on Monday, I wouldn't have sent any onions to Pretoria, uh, for instance. Now, it's all, not, obviously not that easy. If it's overstocked everywhere, then it's a problem. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, just to answer your question, the, the, the indirect costs, I think, is something that we we need to take into consideration a bit more. Matthijs, just coming to you, um, hidden, hidden costs, uh, the most expensive link, um, and, and we're talking here about perhaps um, offload points, um, and I can't think of the English word now, standtight. Talk to us about yeah, that. So, so I think, I think there's, maybe let's go, let me deal with cost elements and what drives cost in, in two separate answers. I think so cost elements, obviously, logistics is a capital intensive and a labor intensive industry. If you look at international shipping, somewhere in Russia just threatens war, shipping prices triple up. We, we all understand that game. Closer to home transportation, if you look at the cost of the vehicle, capital investment, cost of the driver and the cost of fuel. That makes up 70% of a transportation company or business's cost. Would be the same for the farmer. On the warehousing side, building, people, security, systems, forklifts, 80% of your cost. Now, all these things that I've mentioned are expensive items. And all these things I've mentioned are obviously linked to inflation. And they, in they increase by higher inflation numbers than what, than what we see published uh, in the CPI stats. Fuel is an example just in the last 10 years, July on July, now that, in, that includes this recent decrease, mm -hmm. has gone up by 101%. Yeah. Fuel is 35 oh. to 45% of, of any transporter's cost. I don't know what the percentage is on the farm, probably 10, 15%. So you start doing those numbers. It, it's an expensive game we're playing. What drives the cost though? I think of course, I mean, your, your route to market strategy and how you want to surface the market, those things determine the ultimate supply chain cost, but if we ignore the, the strategic part of it, obviously distance, the further away, the more you pay, time, any time delay or time it takes uh, reduces your asset utilization and therefore increases your unit price and ultimately it's about what did I pay per bag of mm -hmm. potatoes. Um, and inefficiency, I think, I think inefficiency is the one thing that we all ignore. Um, how do you fix efficiency? Well, visibility, make sure you're on top of, on top of of everything and understand your supply chain properly, properly. But 
Inefficiency will always be there, and unfortunately, inefficiency will find, will find its way into the price. And then we pay. Who pays for the inefficiency? The guy who buys the bag of potatoes, he pays. Um, so that's me and you. So I think um, important that, that you measure the inefficiencies and that you are aware of those inefficiencies and try and be, prevent them from happening. And again, a stat that will, that will resonate with all of you, again, if you take primary transportation, a six by four truck tractor with a taut line and super link combination. The standing time cost for a unit like that is between 550 and 650 rand an hour. So you stand on the farm, you stand at the market, you stand at the border, you stand next to the road, you, you add up all those inefficiencies purely just in the transportation component. It's enormous numbers. And like I said, we, we pay. The guy who made the mashed potatoes last night, he paid. So yeah, it's cost of, capital intensive, labor intensive. Maybe I can just add on that. Uh, another thing to, to keep into consideration, uh, what I say now, is say that, uh, but at the end, it's the farmer paying. Uh, but yes. uh, the product, on, this is only our data, our own data. We've been collecting it now for about four years. On the sleepover curve, in five days, uh, we lose about 20% of value. And on 10 days, it's 50% uh, on, on the price of potatoes, specifically. So I think, I mean, that is a tremendous, tremendous cost. That, uh, value depreciation or whatever you want to call it. Mm. I want to add to it, that's why there can't be inefficiency. You cannot yeah. have inefficiency if those are the timelines that, you, that, you, that you're solving for. So, so the whole point is to, to, to find where those inefficiencies are, to root them out, to, to, put, to build bridges over those inefficiencies so we can get there quicker, faster, uh, with, with less stops along the way, and everyone in the chain can make more money. Um, Vili, it's, it's a big dream. Some might say it's a pipe dream. Um, what do you think are some of the things that needs to happen besides all this information being put on the Potatoes SA app that's, <laughs> that's going to get us to that dream? Um, Ali, I don't think there's too much of an ulterior motive in terms of the use of the Potatoes South Africa app. I think uh, for me, uh, the big dream in our space is to really find a point where there's no unnecessary losses or no unnecessary premiums paid um, due to um, a risk that's been seen. Uh, and the other thing is, we, we've only spoken, I think most of the conversation went up to actually where Yaku has to take the hand off in the, in, in, the, in the general market space. But we also need to realize how much space needs to be opened up behind, let's call it, call it the fresh produce market to actually get to the final consumer. Um, and we've got an aggregation point where a large volume of product gets together at a certain point, but then it needs to be disaggregated, it needs to be dis distributed. If we believe that the complication is get it up to the fresh produce market, and I would want to pose that question to Yaku, how do you get the product actually to the, to the consumer um, and also be able to bridge all these nuances that we've got? So perhaps here's a good time to, to look at the different markets because we've got fresh produce markets, we've got then this disaggregation that happens, um, but concurrent or parallel to that, we've got an incredible informal market in South Africa, um, which, which functions pretty much according to, to its own rules. But to think that there are no rules or that it doesn't function, um, you know, you, you're really underestimating the value. Tell us a little bit more about how those markets function together. Sure. I think a week or two ago there was a, um, a piece, I can't remember in which, in, in, in what media, but the hidden, hidden economies um, value they predicted was 750 billion rand in the informal economy. But it's also at your peril to assume that informal is unprofessional or inefficient. And that would be at your own peril. And in terms of that market, it is highly competitive. And it requires an environment where you can serve those buyers. And those buyers will end up serving the end consumer. And and in that space, I believe we solve 
either collectively or at aggregation points, logistics or logistical challenges, yeah. we'd be able to sell more on behalf of our producers. It's an enormous market, but underserved. So part of the strategy in our business was to say, can we create aggregation points in underserved areas? And it was a challenge. We, we think we have a recipe, not the final recipe. And when you look at those aggregation points or selling points in underserved areas, if you start to add the farmer's sales together, they are starting to compete under the top four of the metro markets if you start to add in a very short space of time. So suddenly you sit in an environment where producers had to take a decision to drive their, or to transport their produce 500 or 700 kilometers to where they could do it now in 50 or 60 or 200 kilometers. The same for the, for the buyers and then the same efficiencies then land up for probably access to produce and fresher produce at home in terms of that process. So, and a lot of that space is informal. And what's the interlink between price formation, between the two markets? It functions on the same basis, but because it's a, a smaller microcosm, it will lead off the larger, the larger markets in terms of, of price signals, and then obviously the logistical cost becomes a component to find, to find the end price that makes it competitive for the producer to, to, to make that marketing decision. Mm. Yeah. Setia, what kind of risk premiums are built into your supply chain logistics model to cover you? Because you mean, you, you, you've got to be covered for the, the unplanned, unpredictable events. Yeah, it's not, it's not, a, it's not easy, um, but I think uh, what from the industry side, what has been a tremendous help so far, I think what Jaco mentioned now, the regional markets as they are called, uh, it, 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 it helps us as farmers because we can do the calculation. We can do, see if it's worthwhile to send a truck to King Williamstown or wherever. Um, and with, with more aggregation points, we are able to uh, spread the supply evenly, and I think at the end of the day, the let's say the the, the extra uh, 50 or odd rands that the consumer are willing to pay for our product, we just want to get what we get and what the consumers pay closer to each other. Uh, and for for us, the only way at this stage. Um, I think is a sort of vertical integration. We need to move closer to the consumer uh, and uh, make sure that every single uh, pallet and every single load that gets transported to that aggregation point or market is sold at the best net farm gate price. And to make sure, bring everything in calculation the sleepover curve, being your own competition, uh, a lot of it has to do with how much that aggregation point or market can handle. Uh, for instance, a smaller market, you, you're not able to send two or three loads, obviously. Um, so it's a combination of analytics and gut feel. Moving, producers moving closer to the end consumer, Yaku. Market your benaut. No. Good. I, I think we've got to start to understand that producers are not responsible for feeding 75 million people anymore or whatever. They're responsible to feed 350 million people. That's who you need to get to. We had a producer on the market yesterday that sort of is farming bananas in Mozambique sending trucks to the market and figuring out, can I utilize my, my transport back to farm? And we don't always have that insight because it might be a little bit removed, but for a pocket of potatoes purchased on 
Johannesburg market, the price for that same pocket of potatoes uh, a week later was 280 rand a bag in current conditions. Mm -hmm. Now we solve that problem, we create, we create um, sales space for producers mm -hmm. and we create a more affordable product for the consumer and therefore I believe enhance demand for product being produced and the producer that takes all of the risk, we must understand that, producers take all the risk. I think that's an element that will, that will spread that risk if we can create more sales points and more aggregation points um, for producers and then start to feed that intelligence back into the system mm. so that it informs the producer what to produce and become less, I wouldn't say production oriented, but more consumer oriented over time if we have the right information. Mm. That's how I, so it doesn't scare me. Uh, I'm excited yeah. about it. Billy, so, so in Newspeak, we would talk about infrastructure development. You know, that's, that's what we, a phrase we hear constantly, and PPPs. Um, where is the space going in terms of um, these partnerships and private investment to, to get that infrastructure in place, those smaller aggregation points? Um, and, and what are we looking at in terms of systems to manage that so that not only do we have, because we, we've got to be realistic, the more aggregation points we have, the more points there are in this chain where we need to gather information from and who need to feed information back into that system so that it can work in real time. Uh, we, we, we could either overcomplicate life for ourselves and create points in the chain that just drop out, they don't feed information, and then all the points around them are stuck. Um, what does the space look like? And, and, and sorry, I, I don't want to ask like a three paragraph question. Apparently, I have a problem with that. <laughs> I do that quite often. <laughs> <laughs> but we see a lot more positivity. Two years ago, people were very frustrated, but people seem to be a lot more positive that these things are going to happen. Look, um, I don't think the frustration is going to reduce much soon. Uh, what, what, I, what I experience is that uh, people make sense of the profitability of certain, um, let's call it channels, quite faster, businesses, and they take that opportunity. Uh, and I want to, to throw it back a little bit to, to DP and the, and the way of thinking about things um, at the end of this, but uh, the, the principle for me is um, there's a space in which uh, let's call it government service need to operate, and that is in terms of servicing proper infrastructure. Uh, they cannot determine the demand of that specific infrastructure. That needs to be a commercial-based storyline. So where the hands need to get together, the commercial base needs to determine what the feasibility of it is. Um, then it needs to be enhanced through the service of government service to be able to create that infrastructure because you obviously use your tax money to get joint services in place. Um, and that combination needs to be able to create what we call, and, and similar to what we've got in our um, municipal markets at the moment. Uh, the biggest in, uh, the problem is, is that the profitability of the governmental institution is under pressure. That means they cannot actually service those units, um, let's call it in isolation. The money moves into their own pockets and back. And that creates the inefficiencies that actually causes this reaction that we have on the, let's call it the public-private partnership space. You will experience um, a lot of entities when there's critical mass to actually take over that whole commercial space, to put in the infrastructure, actually to settle things. And this is what I wanted to, to, to bring down, to things that I've picked up. You know, people building DCs from ground level up, if it makes sense. Uh, and put it in there. So if, it, if it's gonna make commercial sense and it's got critical mass, commerce is gonna take care of it, business is gonna take care of it. If it's something that needs to be enhanced and that has got a social impact that needs to support the communities and those type of things around it and there's not such a high level of profitability, the principle of public-private partnership is, is, is the pinnacle of that, of that execution. So I think if I, I just want to see here some examples, and I'm talking about worldwide examples that mm -hmm. you've had, but I swear, the, 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 the value chain makes sense, the business case makes sense, and putting that infrastructure mm -hmm. in place 
on yeah. Angkor. Yeah, Vili, I think, I think, thanks for that. I think there's, there's a couple of, you talk about the infrastructure, but I think there's, there's one or two other elements as well, because often the infrastructure on your, on, on your page, and I think, Yaku, you touched on it in the beginning, mm. important to have it in the right place, the right location, etc. Mm. We, we all understand the logic of that, and it needs to be functional. Mm. And I think you touched on quite a bit of that. The, the piece I want to also add to that is the funding. Because mm. you might have the facility and you might have sorted out the entire physical supply chain, but the producer might not have the funds or the means to actually do the transaction or perform the trade. So, so I think there's also, there's infrastructure and funding, I think, play, play both play a very big role. And I can, some, I can use some examples without sounding like a salesman of the things that we have done. Um, we've recently started putting together a solution for, for tea in Kenya. So we, we physically buy the tea on an auction on behalf of the producer, and therefore we fund the entire product as well as the supply chain to the end destination across 13 destinations in the world. Now all of a sudden you make a Rwandan farmer or a Ugandan farmer or a Kenya farmer, uh, you give him the ability to sell tea into America because there's funding all of a sudden available to perform a transaction. So that's where the funding piece plays a major role. And of course you need the infrastructure because you need to deal with the tea and pack oh. it and, and load containers. Uh, we've got some plans, uh, I mean, there's, there's in, at an investment level, um, there's three billion US dollars being approved up to 2029. So over the next five years, this is sub-Saharan Africa, DP World Sub-Saharan Africa, planning on spending three billion in infrastructure, port infrastructure, back of port operations. Uh, those could be markets, could be anything. Whatever will enable the logistics chain, we would invest the money in. We'd be willing to look at the business case and make those investments. And again, don't forget the funding piece that I spoke about. Very important because I'm going to add one more element. If, if, and if I say more, you are going to think I'm a salesman. Um, <laughs> we, we service in Western East Africa about 460,000 sales points where we take ownership of the stock. So in that case, it's not a supply chain finance model. So it's not an off balance, it's not a, it's not an off balance sheet funding mechanism. We physically take ownership and buy the stock. We now own the potatoes and we then on-sell it into the market. And we service 460, 480 odd thousand delivery points across West and East Africa. And, and I'm privileged enough to travel to those regions from time to time. I can tell you the, the quality we have here is it, it's beyond world class when you start comparing it to what we see in those regions. So I think there's a, with the right infrastructure and the right funding model, there's a market outside which we haven't even thought of yet. Forget it, the South African market is, is small compared to what this could be when you start getting into Africa. And, and where we also try and um, enable these things, we work quite closely with, there's an Africa continental free trade area, uh, which is a government initiative, very, very good government initiative where government engage with government to break down barriers, border delays, legislation that, that prevents trade, VAT and duties and all sorts of payments. Now, Africa Free Trade has made huge progress in signing up a number of African countries where trade agreements has been signed between governments. They go to the point where they will go with the producer, they will go with you to the Kenyan government to have the meeting with the minister to set up the flow of trade for you. So, so as DP World, we work very closely with those associations because ultimately you want to break down you want to keep the border, but you want to break down the, 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 the barrier yes. it puts in the space of trade. Mensen moeten koel drank kopen. So you want the trade to flow. <laughs> Leave the border gate in place, but let the trade flow. So, uh, so I think so it's, a, it's a number of things. Um, but infrastructure, absolutely, and the money to back it. Those are the two, I think, the, the two things you have to combine. Mm. And, and then on that point, I think, Yaku, I need to understand. You, you, you've spoken about it. Um, how much infrastructure considerations have you put in place to get to that, let's call it golden market, if you want to call it that? We, we just found our, our, finance, <laughs> our finance partner, and we don't need a lot. Uh, Congratulations, Mateus, we need, we'll, uh, we'll put the commission check We need check 200 down. million dollars for, for to, do, to, to build four new markets, and uh, we'd be in a very, very good space. And the other part of markets are, they don't live for five or 10 years or 15 years, they live for 40, 60, 70, 100 years. So you've got to find the right space, got to find the right partner, and you can't think five years ahead. We need to sit down and think 40 years ahead. Mm. But in those spaces, 
Um, I think there's a, where the failings are, and it makes commercial sense, the commerce will replace that inefficiency. Philly, you're going to have to start another app as well, business <laughs> e-dating, <laughs> matchmaking. We've got about nine, nine or ten minutes left. I want to get to, to an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. But before we get there, I think we also have to just acknowledge uh, we're talking about 2050 is now. So a big part of the, the Congress over the, these two days is about technology, about innovation, about future thinking to solve inefficiencies. Um, you, you can all put your hand up whoever most wants to answer the question about the role of AI and consolidated data management to make this dream of worldwide just-in-time um, efficient all along the route come true. I don't have the full answer for you, but if you have the information and you make, you make all the components available, I, I can't even imagine what that can bring. Imagine you bring that visibility, the, let's call it the Vili, it's not a dream, it's actually reality. The Vili reality, if you, you string together the stuff we spoke about here now, and we, there will not, stuff like inefficiency and unnecessary cost will disappear, it won't exist. Information makes it possible for you to proactively fix and to a comment I made previously, you want to start predicting what's your next problem going to be. When you predict the next problem, it ain't gonna happen. You're gonna get there and the problem will have, would have disappeared because you would have known the problem was on the way. I think that's where information and visibility will take us. It's, it's, uh, I don't think we can imagine it, it's too big. Mm. Yaku? You've got a very interesting expression on your face. I'd kill to know what you're really yes, thinking. I can, I, I can get into trouble. But <laughs> I, the, 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 for me, we are probably sitting on information the world envy. But we have an element of where there's questions, but who owns it? Mm. And you have a municipal institution that says it's mine. You then have these Chinese walls that are being built to try and get access to make this a more efficient space. So if you, and, and I don't know if any, but if you look in the last 40 years, 40 years I'm talking about, we, when we're still selling on pink slips, um, and some markets today still sell on pink slips. <laughs> you know? so, but, so the context for me is what has been developed in that space from a notable um, platform tech perspective in the last 40 years. And then you'll see where the real opportunity is in that yeah. space. And I know we, we, we've got up and coming platforms happening, but there's still a deficiency in terms of the volume of aggregation and where price is being discovered. And that we need to fix from a principal perspective. But it's, it's a very exciting space. Super. I think on that point, we are going to open the floor to the audience for questions. Uh, if you have a question for any of our panelists, not for me, because I don't know anything that you want to know. Uh, anyone with a question? In the front here, yes. Can we have a microphone, please? Jared is bringing one here. There we go, sir. Uh, good morning. I think it's music to my ears when you talk about the informal sector. And um, yesterday I introduced myself as Suleiman. I represent only a certain region of the Western Cape of the informal sector. So I think Epping Market is not here, but they can verify the information. Between 60 and 65 percent of the potatoes of these farmers we buy. Now. Talking about the uh, digital markets and all that, we're not technically inclined. We know how to sell the damn thing, that's it. Mm. Now we need to be clustered with all that information in order to get to the level that you want us to be. But that is not gonna happen like tomorrow. It is a process. But we know how to sell your product, even though whatever quality you send to us or whatever the market. One thing I want to add into the turnaround space, all right, that is where we are. We turn every day loads of potatoes. 
it doesn't stand with us because we don't have the infrastructure. We have to move it. Slow margins, one rent, two rent, three rent, five rent max on the back of potato, but we move it. We don't complain about the transport and all of those things because somebody else is maybe having that as a, as a meal. But for us, that is where we are. So I think from here, as the platform is set by Potato SA, now the engagement needs to happen. Where does the collaboration start? How do we rally all the little markets or the agri spaces that you, you intend? We can give you that information. It happened to, I think, prior to the Poppy Act, we could have accessed all our members' transactions. What they do, how they do, when they do, we got all that data. When the Poppy Act kicked in, uh, we didn't need to have permission. That process is administration process delayed everything. So I can't come here and tell you, you know what, we have the stats because there's barriers as the man explained. Mm -hmm. But for us, we said there is the conversation, there's the platform built by Potato SA, let's engage. There's a lot of regions, so we need to mobilize a lot in order to get a more better distribution for the farmer. And maybe that will reinvent or regenerate the, the distribution model where finance is concerned and a more stable market and not hope that you get the honest agent. But that's basically, my input is basically uh, um, to, to not it down, the, the, the sales space, we got it. Mm. But we don't have the, the funding or, else, or the administration market to actually manage it. So there's okay. a little skills that needs to be transferred. Mm. But that is all part of investment, I think. So I'm asking for the floor to consider that most of us are representing in different regions the informal sector to bring the informal sector to the platform. Yeah. Open up the door and let us mobilize ourselves and let's see what is the requirement to actually talk on your level and understand and bring the customer to appreciate the potatoes that have been produced. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, yeah. I only know honest agents. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> of all that you've heard, the honest agent. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, it's uh, important. I think, uh, maybe <laughs> just, just in response, and uh, Yaku, um, I suggest you be in the next panel so that the two of you can have a few conversations as well. Absolutely. Um, but uh, just given, given the conversation that we have here, that's exactly what we are trying to solve. Uh, but as the conversation goes around to who owns the data, uh, I wish somebody would understand that there's no data on a ship anymore. Uh, whether there's legislation or something behind that, there's no data. Today, all my information is all over. I get 20 phone calls from flipping automated phones every day. Um, we need to understand that. And um, as soon as we can get to recognize the, the, the limitations put on uh, the, through certain legislation onto our ability to use that data and to actually make commercial sense of it. And, and at the end of the day, it goes about the value proposition to the consumer. The moment we can get a product faster with less issues and less difficulties onto the consumer's plate, we can actually reduce the consumer cost. And that will grow the demand for any type of product along any type of line. Um, so, so data clarity, data understanding, and then the functionality to be able to create sense out of the data and create insights. Uh, will be, for me, one of the biggest challenges going forward. Any other questions from the audience? There's one. Fantastic. Very quick hand. It's Gary Forster. I don't know who is he going to ask. Yeah. Afternoon. Um, my name's Gary Forster. I'd like to ask the panel. Um, the theme of this whole conference is uh, 2050s now. So if you look at our fresh produce market system that works on agents' commission, it's a pretty unique system in the whole world. Is the rest of the world going to follow us or are we going to follow the rest of the world? Because the rest of the world, mo most of the potato production is done on a sort of contract basis to the major chain stores. Mm. 
So if you look at our um, uh, fresh market produce system with a commission agent, it sucks about 12% of the value of the product out of the, mm. the value of the potato that we're selling. What is our future? Okay. Is that for me? Um, <laughs> Gary, thank you. Um, a little story, our time's up, a little story. And I can't remember who was involved in it, about when we played the All Blacks um, the first time at Soccer City, the English Potato Commission visited South Africa. And it was a Friday morning on Johannesburg Market, and it was humming. And we had UK potato producers, and they, they, they produce about the same amount of potatoes as us, 2.2, 2.3 million tons of potatoes. And we took them through the market, and it, it was, uh, we had, luckily, they, they, uh, we could see them. You know, they, were, they weren't as, they, we, could, we could find them. And then we ended up in the office, and it was a Potato South Africa facilitated sort of process. And here's the discussion, Gary, that got me in terms of it. And we sat down and we, and we discussed the agency model, the system, the commission process, because commission, that is a cost to the producer, becomes a, is a function of the price. And we must not forget that. A buyer walks on the market floor and does not ask uh, how much commission is the farmer paying you. He asks, what's the price? So it becomes a function of a price, and we got to understand that process. The other part that, that was the, 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 the producer asked us, but when do you pay your farmers? I say, well, by law, it's within five days of the first sale. And sometimes when your payment runs are, are, are sequenced, if the, if the consignment is sold out today, the farmer gets his money today, paid in his bank account tomorrow. And that Englishman nearly fell off the chair. Because then we asked him, but in your case? And he looked around the table, and he says, you guys must answer, because it was, I can't remember, and 90 days. Mm. But before he put anything in the ground, he wanted to have a contract. Because otherwise, in a highly subsidized environment, like the rest of the world, I believe it's anti-competitive in terms of that space. The mm. other element, um, the, uh, the farmers ask, how many buyers do you have? Well, at any given point in time, on a daily basis, probably 30 to 40,000 buyers buying potatoes every single day, th hopefully 365 days a year. And the, the counter question to them was, how many do you have? And he looked around the room and he said, oh, six. <laughs> and Gary, that's the difference. In terms of where we are and in terms of where, where, where we think we should be going. Seti, we're going to let you as the grower have the final say just so that we can, we can keep everyone happy. I, I see they started the clock over. Yeah. Again, yeah, we've got another 12, 15 minutes. You don't have a tea break. Uh, it, price being determined by supply and demand is not a South African fresh produce concept. It's an economical concept. And it's a worldwide concept. Um, even though they may have a contract, in the end, it's still a form of supply and demand determining that price. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, we are, I see it in a way that that's not our challenge. The 10% commission or 12% commission or uh, whatever the commission is, is, is not the challenge. Uh, maybe the 5% that goes to the municipality, that's definitely a problem. <laughs> but the, um, the, the challenge is the, the difference between what the consumer is willing to pay and what that price is on the market. Uh, and that is a whole lot of insufficiency. That's what it is. It's insufficiency. Um, and I think, just to echo what Yaku said earlier about the, the, the efficiency of the informal market, you don't see that in the informal market. The price between what we as farmers get and what the, uh, the, the consumers the informal market pay is much closer to each other. But there's a load of middlemen, and uh, uh, there's very few of them, but a few dishonest uh, market <laughs> agents <laughs> that uh, make use of the opportunity to increase that inefficiency to retailers and what the end consumers pay at the end. And the other thing in South Africa, 
I'm, I'm not sure what the percentage is, but what the percentage is, but uh, the informal market is much bigger uh, consumer of our products than the formal market. So uh, to get our product to the informal market, I don't see any more efficient way than our fresh produce markets. Mm. So we're not going to solve all the problems today, but uh, but it's been a very engaging uh, discussion. Yaku unsa nana yorechi fra ni man yo pikni. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Matthias, Sietia, Yaku, Veli. Thank you to our audience. Uh, round of applause. Thank you.